The first reading is from Amos, the fifth chapter. Seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel with no one to quench it. Ah, you that turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground. They hate the one who reproves in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from them levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine, for I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate, therefore the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Here ends the first reading. The psalm reading is Psalm 90, and we will read the verses responsively. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Satisfy us by your steadfast love in the morning, so shall we rejoice and be glad all our days. Show your servants your works and your splendor to their children. The second reading is from Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then we have a great high priest, who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every aspect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Here ends the second reading. Would you all please rise? <clears throat> Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter, beginning with the 17th verse. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard is it, 
how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last shall be first. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This fall has been the season of weddings. At rehearsal for the bridal party, I have them line up in reverse order. And when I say reverse order, it sort of turns their brains around like, okay, what? Well, okay, reverse order, that means we got to flip the order that we're thinking about. And the guys are like, what? What? Reverse order, don't get it. And so I end up echoing the words of Jesus today at wedding rehearsals, and I yell out like a decree, the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. And then all of a sudden they're kind of like, oh, I get it now. And so they go in their separate directions and they make their way. And it's beautiful. It works. And so, yes, there is the best man that would be coming in last, and the maid of honor would be coming in last as well. And so, yes, even the best of men and those with the highest of honors, Jesus says, will be last. Jesus speaks of this reversal of fates, in today's gospel, this flipping upside down of the kingdom, this fall turnover, a time when the elevated fall and the lowly are raised. It is a turnover, a new kingdom. I don't know if you noticed the front bulletin cover with the walleye on the front with fall turnover. did I have anything to do with that? Uh, yeah, yes, I did. I, I thought it was absolutely beautiful, that walleye and the full moon. And the title for today being full, Fall Turnover. It is fall turnover in the Brainerd Lakes area here as well. Once the water temperatures hit 53 degrees, which they actually did a while ago, it is happening really fast. It has been so crazy cold. Once the water temperature hits 53 degrees, it marks the beginning of the fall turnover where there's a mixing and churning of oxygen and it gets spread throughout the entire water column at all levels and depths of the lake. Prior to this, in summertime and even into September, if you look at the lake, there's all sorts of layers of stratification or sort of levels at which the oxygen sort of hang out mostly, and most notably it's what they call the thermocline, and that's sort of cool water where there's a lot of oxygen. But once fall turnover hits, everything gets churned up. And temperatures now on lakes are below 50 degrees, and so it is is really happening fast. And so once turnover is actually occurring, there's about a week or two where it sort of baffles fishermen. They don't know how to catch a fish. Oh, I I don't say they, I should just say me. I don't know how to catch a fish during fall turnover. And it's just a tough time because the fish are sort of unsettled and they don't know what's going on. And then it's not until the post turnover bite, which is below 50 degrees, that uh, that fish start biting again. I was just out on Friday and I can't believe it, 47 degree water temperatures. Folks, we don't normally see that sort of water temperature until like the first or second week in November. I mean, things are really cold on the water right now. 
And at 50 degrees, this is the temperature of under, underground water. So like if you took a drill and went right down, the temperature of that water is 50 degrees. I find that very interesting how all of these things sort of happen at the basal temperature of underground water. So fall turnover, it's a time to mix things up a bit, like oxygen in the lakes. It's, it's an unsettling time for fish and for fishermen who have a, t a tough time catching them. And so the disciples today are caught up in this sort of chilled world as well. They don't get it. They're, they're in kind of a turnover as well because they were greatly astounded as they heard about this rich man who had it all. He had possessions, and not only did he have everything he needed, he kept the commandments. And so the disciples looked at each other with dismay, and they're like, okay, if this guy can't be saved, I mean, what, what's going on? Then, then who can be saved if this guy is having a tough time? And then a chill came through the air, ushering this sort of fall turnover when Jesus said to the rich man, I love it, Jesus said to the rich man, with love, the gospel says. He says to the rich man with love, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have. Give your money to the poor, and then you will store up your treasures in heaven. And then Jesus says, come and follow me. When the rich man had heard this, he was shocked. The nice stratification of societal layers, like in midsummer, when everything makes sense and you know exactly where people stand, this messed him up. He did not like to hear what Jesus was saying. And so upon hearing this, he was shocked. He was in sort of a fall turnover, and the man turned and walked away. His thoughts were unsettled, and he pursed his lips with a frustrated sort of pout like this. Turned his head down. He looked just like a lip-locked walleye in the middle of fall turnover. I mean, there's nothing you can do. I mean, you can't, you can jigger and wrap, you can put your bait right in front of them, and they want nothing to do with what you got. This is the rich man as he walked away from Jesus during this fall turnover. And so this, there was a chill in the air as the disciples were confused, and the rich man walked away from what Jesus was saying. This last Wednesday, there was a, an amazing thing that happened here. It happens every uh, every year, second week in October, our sophomores read their faith statements. And it's officially called catechization, a night where they share <clears throat> their faith statements and their parents and godparents and grandparents are there to hear the stories of these, of these sophomores. In Greek, <clears throat> literally sophomore means a wise fool. I love it. <laughs> uh, but ironically, this is my prayer for these sophomores, that they continue to be fools, that is, fools for Christ, and wise, following the words and ways of God in their lives. I have been and continually am inspired by these 18 people who will be affirming their faith at the end of this month, at the last Sunday, on Reformation Sunday. I look forward to this time with them and their families as they say yes to what God has done in their baptism and to say yes to how they've been formed and reformed in our church. This is a message not only for the church, that the church is always changing and being made new in Christ, that we are as well, that we are always changing and being made new in Christ. And so this fall marks the turnover of a new class of confirmands and a colorful new turnover for them as new confirmed members of our congregation. Fall turnover, what does this mean for you? Maybe it's a time to mix it up a bit. What needs stirring 
in your soul? In what ways can we be humbled or have our hearts softened? This is basically what Jesus is asking for today. Humility and an open heart to be teachable in his ways. This part isn't in the notes at all, but this last week I've had to be teachable and humble in heart. As you see, I have a new pair of glasses. I had to learn how to walk again. <laughs> Those stairs out there are kind of intimidating. I'm 20-20 distance, but I can't see below me without these, uh, well, they're kind of like built-in cheaters. But the first three days of wearing these babies, oof -da. I could. I thought my feet were really close, but my feet are still the same distance as they were before. And so I've been teachable, and it was the office staff that actually said, Hans, hey, you need to make an eye appointment. And I'm like, oh, can I just keep doing the trombone and the cheaters? And they're like, no, you must go. And my wife, of course, told me that about three years ago. But So I've, I've, it's a humbling experience. So stirring it up, mixing it up, this is what Jesus is asking of the rich man. The rich man was set in those ways that society had structured. And then when Jesus came to him with love and told him what he must do, the rich man walked away with a frustrated pout on his lips. Yeah, he said that too. And he walked away, and he walked away from Jesus. One of the ways that we can give at Trinity is just hanging around church a little bit. Instead of coming to church and just walking out the doors, we can be present here, go to fellowship, and start asking questions, how can I help? Or what areas of ministry are there, uh, there are ways that we can help or, or things that we can do? There have been a couple of families in, the, in, in recent last couple months who've, uh, who've signed up to help at the soup kitchen. And they, they came with their family and they, they enjoyed serving there at the soup kitchen so much that now they want to do it every month. And <laughs> I kind of have to put the, hold the reins back. I'm like, whoa, whoa, it'd be great if you could do it every month. But um, we need to provide that opportunity for other people as well. So there's joy, there's joy and wonderful things that can happen in service to others. And just the other day, there was a, there was a sixth grade girl who came up to me and said, I would like to start a, a youth choir. And I, and I said, well, that's great. Let's make it happen. Because she loves to sing. And wouldn't that be awesome if we could have a youth choir here at church? I said, let's go for it. And so I ask you on this fall turnover, What's mixing in your soul? What are ways that we can do ministry together in new ways? And so, for walleyes in the next week or so, they will adjust to this crazy cool weather. I'm not sure we will, but the walleyes eventually will. As the underwater green vegetation turns into sort of an earthy sort of brown, some walleyes will still kind of be on the break lines, and then others will, will go down into a variety of depths, 20 to 50 feet deep. And then other walleyes will just go down onto the bottom of the lake and sort of hug the bottom and wait till the hard water hits. <laughs> they just kind of lay there and don't do anything. As for us during this fall turnover, we realize that we have patterns of behavior just like fish do. That our mid to late summer patterns, that there was definite order and patterns to the way we do things in summer, and there are rhythms there. But with fall, things change. There's a mixing up of schedules. There's transitions between fall sports now and winter sports. There's activities of all sorts, bringing parents and grandparents to their children's things. There's yard work, there's winterizing, there's the list, the list that goes on and on. Somebody just told me we've had 11 out of 12 days of where it's precipitated, where it's rained or, or snowed. 11 out of 12 days. I think it was Friday was the only day it hadn't. 
And so there's things that mix it up this fall. So this fall, Jesus' kingdom comes and says, let's mix it up a little bit. How can you and I serve and follow, love and lead, and walk in his ways? Jesus leads you and I with love and then says to us, line up in reverse order. That is to leave behind our selfish pride and our foolish pride and to come and lead with humble hearts as we come here to the front, to the foot of the cross, where Jesus bids us to follow him. And let us, when asked to follow Jesus, not be like the rich man who walked away with a frustrated pout and his countenance downward. But let us follow Jesus with humble hearts, following him with our heads held high. Amen.